Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for another worked out example. This time we're dealing with a rolling wheel with friction. So we have a wheel that's rolling along and they're sliding friction between the point of contact of the wheel and the ground. For this example, we'll be using the notion of force and torque to work out the answer. Let's see the exact description. So we have a solid cylinder thrown horizontally with an initial speed V0. The surface of the wheel is just touching the ground but the initial angular velocity is zero. That means the thing's not rotating at all. Of course, as time goes on, the frictional force between the sliding point of contact and the ground causes the wheel to rotate, but it simultaneously causes the wheel to slow down. At some point, the speed of the wheel's rotation matches the speed of motion, the center of mass motion, and then from that point forward, the wheel rolls without sliding. You guys have probably seen this if you've ever been bowling. When you first release the bowling ball, it slides down the bowling alley and slowly picks up rotational speed, angular velocity, until the angular velocity and the translational motion match, sync up. Let's, uh, let's see how that works. The, the question this problem is asking is how long does that take and what's the final speed of the system, the center of mass of the system at that time? So let's look at a little demo and see if we can get some intuition. So here's a 3D demo of a disk and it's on a kind of a track here and I'm graphing down here two things. The V is the velocity of the center of mass. This guy's going to start out with about 3 meters per second of velocity and omega times R which is the speed of a point on the rim of the disk relative to the center of mass. That's going to start at zero. The idea is somebody throws the thing, it's not spinning at all, but there's friction between the point of contact and the ground, and so the thing slowly spins up to speed. At some point, it reaches the, the velocity where the speed of a point on the rim is equal to the speed of the center of mass relative to the ground, and then the point of contact stops slipping. So, let's see how that works. You can see that the speed is dropping, the angular velocity is increasing. At some point they reach equality here, and that's where the thing stops sliding. It starts at 3 meters per second. It looks like it's ending up at around 2 meters a second. There you can see it, 2 meters a second. Um, let's see if that makes any sense. Okay, let's draw a physics picture that describes what's going on. We've got a wheel rolling, touching the ground, moving with a speed V center of mass, the center of mass of the wheel is moving with a speed V to the right. But there are forces acting. So there's a normal force pushing up from the ground. There's the weight of the wheel, the earth pulling down on the disc, I guess it's a disc really, uh, with a force equal to its weight. And there's of course the frictional force, the sliding force of friction between the point of contact and the ground. So how are we going to attack this? Let's apply the momentum principle, or Newton's second law, by another name, and demand that the rate of change of the momentum equal the sum of the forces acting on the object. Another way to say that is the mass of the object times the rate of change of its velocity is equal to the sum of the forces acting. The easiest way to analyze this guy is to break it into components. So the x component says that the mass of the disk times the rate of change of the x component of the center of mass velocity is equal to the negative of the magnitude of the frictional force. In other words, the x component of the frictional force. Then the y component of the momentum principle says that the rate of change of the y component of the center of mass velocity has got to be zero. That means that the upward force of the normal force, the upward force of the ground pushing up on the wheel, and the force of the earth pulling down on the wheel must cancel. So that basically tells us that the normal force has to equal the weight. With that information, I can go back and use the, our empirical understanding of kinetic friction and compute the value of the kinetic friction and put that back into the x component of the momentum principle and finally get a fairly finished result for the rate of change of the x component of velocity. You'll notice that the mass of the disk shows up on both sides of this guy, so it's going to cancel out. And what I'm going to get is a statement that's quite simple. It simply says that the rate of change of the x-component velocity is constant. In other words, 
If I were to graph the x component of velocity versus time, I'd end up with a straight line with a constant slope. And that slope is minus the coefficient of friction times the strength of the gravitational field, g. Of course, the thing starts out with the speed v0, and that speed diminishes as time goes on. All right, now let's go back and look at the torque situation, the angular velocity situation. We need to apply the angular momentum principle, which says that the rate of change of the angular momentum is equal to the net torque. But the net torque is the sum of the torques produced by each of the forces acting on the system. We've got a torque from the normal force, a torque from the weight, and a torque from the frictional force. Now, if we choose the center of mass of the wheel as the point about which we compute torques and the point about which we compute angular momentum, then the normal force produces no torque and the weight produces no torque because both of those forces actually go through the center of mass and so the moment arm is going to be zero. But the torque does produce, I mean, excuse me, the frictional force does produce a torque and of course that's nothing other than the magnitude of the frictional force times the radius of the disk. I'm looking, you can see that the angular velocity points into the board and the torque is also going to point into the board. So in terms of magnitudes, the magnitude of the torque is going to be the frictional force times the radius of the disk, and the magnitude of the rate of change of angular momentum is going to be the moment of inertia times the rate of change of the angular velocity. Magnitude. We're talking about the magnitude here. The angular velocity is going to increase in time in magnitude, even though it's going to be pointing more and more into the board. Okay. However, do not forget that the frictional force was related to the mass, and also, because this is a solid disk, it's a disk, it's got a rotational inertia of one-half mr squared. If the thing had a different shape, if it was a sphere or a, cylind a hollow cylinder or something else, you'd have a different relationship there. We can put all that back in, and we get the following result. Of course, the masses cancel again, and I get that d omega dt is 2 mu kg over r. That tells us, since omega starts at zero, that omega has to increase linearly with time. All right, let's make a graph of omega then versus time. It's going to be a linearly increasing graph with a constant slope. Now, what about the speed of a point on the rim of the disk relative to the center of mass? Well, that's simply omega times r. If I multiply this expression by r, you can see that the speed of a point on the rim relative to the center of mass has a constant slope of 2 mu k times g. The interesting thing is to take this graph of the relative speed of a point on the rim and plot it along with the graph that shows the speed of the center of mass. The speed of the center of mass is diminishing with time. The speed of a point on the rim relative to the center of mass is increasing with time. When those two guys are equal, that's when the wheel stops sliding because the condition for non-sliding rolling motion is met. And it's easy enough to write down the equation for the velocity of the center of mass and the speed of a point on the rim relative to the center of mass and calculate the time when those two guys are equal. Turns out to be that expression in the slide. And if I put that time then back in to the speed formula, I get the final speed is two-thirds of the initial speed. Very easy. Okay, talk to you guys soon.